Down in the city streets, we see a man making a mad dash to escape something. But just when he starts to think he may be safe, shadowy figures begin to emerge from the smoke. And while he doesn't know how they knew it was him, he knows he is about to get jumped for sure. They throw smoke grenades on the ground and from that smoke, men in all black emerge to attack him. However, this guy is no pushover as he single-handedly takes down an entire squad of armed soldiers, with nothing but his bare hands. The men in black begin to launch sharp needles at him, but he dodges them while doing backflips and pulls out a knife so he can start counterattacking. He then proceeds to stab the next few ninjas that attack him before continuing his attempt to escape. It looks like we've got ourselves a really good main character, but things start taking a downward spiral as he gets stabbed in the neck by a knife. He got stabbed some more, but I'm sure he'll be fine. I was wrong, he has been decapitated, and the leader of the ninja squad takes a picture to confirm his death and a successful mission before he leaves to return back to base with the rest of the ninjas. Elsewhere on a farm, this man is living the simple life of a farmer and you can tell he enjoys every bit of it. After loading his truck with corn, he drives off to return to his house and by evening, he's spending some time fixing up his motorcycle. He then notices someone approaching him, so he turns around with his soot-covered face and finds his little boy trying to scare him. The boy jumps into his father's arms after he was found out, and his wife soon comes out to join them. And I hate to be that guy, but if that's his wife, this guy's life is way too good for nothing bad to happen. Once they've had dinner and their son has gone to bed, the man is cleaning up the dishes while his wife watches the news and sees a report of the incident of a man being murdered in a back alley. The corpse seemed to have several stab wounds and was decapitated, so the people speculate that it may have been the doing of a criminal organization. This gets the attention of the two as his wife wonders if this was done by the people she thinks. Their son comes back into the room, but this is a serious discussion, so they don't want their son hearing about this. The man goes to put the boy back to bed, and while walking back to the living room, he checks the security cameras he has set up all throughout the farm to make sure they are still safe here, and nothing shows up, so he calms down a little. He gets back to his wife and asks her what's wrong, so she explains that she is worried about the way that guy in the news was killed. And not just that either, as even after doing extensive research on him, there was no information found about what that dude does in his personal life. Which could just mean he's an otaku. But Mary believes otherwise. The man tries to calm her by saying no one would ever find them here, so there's no reason to be so worried, yet she is still concerned that the Reaper might locate them. The man assures her that this wasn't the work of the Reaper because the Reaper always worked alone, but this was clearly a coordinated jumping, so there really is nothing to be worried about. They go on with their family life as normal, having fun and bonding together. But once everyone is asleep, the man makes sure to keep vigilant and patrol the grounds to make sure his family stays safe. The murders continue happening in the city and local authorities are stumped because they know it has the same characteristics as the past three similar occurrences. But there are still no clues or connections between the different victims that they know of. That night, when everyone has gone to bed, there is an ominous red color outside and the man gets up because he feels like something is wrong. He tells Mary to stay in bed for now while he goes to deal with it. So he heads downstairs into the living room and looks out the window. With a second glance, we see those ninjas standing there just staring him down, but now that he has been noticed, they smash through the window and throw their spikes at him. The man dodges them and gets himself ready to take down the intruder as they come at him with swords. The fast-paced action continues as the man slashes away at the ninjas and kills them mercilessly. But then he hears the voice of his son screaming upstairs, so he gets distracted and nearly has his head taken off. He manages to break away and tries to run upstairs to get to his son. But with his back turned, he gets stabbed through the throat by some of those needles and falls to the floor. He is still trying to drag his body up the stairs, but the poison is starting to get to him, so he is much slower in his reactions than earlier. He staggers over to the bedroom to get to his family. But what he finds there is truly horrifying. While his wife did put up a great fight in taking out a bunch of ninjas, she was ultimately overwhelmed and has been slain by the ninjas. And this one must have been personal, because the ninja team leader is smiling like he is really proud of himself as he stabs her neck once more to really let it set in that she's dead. The man is overcome with grief, so even after he gets stabbed in the back with tears in his eyes, he continues trying to make it to his wife and son. But he soon falls over dead from his injuries. One of the ninjas looks out the window and realizes the cops have already shown up at the crime scene, which was pretty quick considering this is a farm in the middle of nowhere. The leader checks the man's pulse to make sure he is dead and satisfied with his results. He tells his team to pack the bodies of the dead ninja and leave before the cops enter and discover the dead bodies of the man and his family. The man's body gets taken to a morgue, and while lying there awaiting an autopsy, he suddenly opens his eyes and crawls off the table. Then the memory of his wife and son being killed comes back to him as he is sprawled out on the floor. He can't take it, so he ends up vomiting and passing out again. 
But the next time he wakes up, he finds himself in a hospital bed after the more workers must have realized he is still alive. The nurses that were watching over him are shocked that he has woken up, so they immediately rush to go call a doctor over as he goes unconscious again. Later, Logan has regained consciousness once more and is being asked if he remembers anything that happened before he got here. He miraculously came back to life after the coroner had pronounced him dead, but what he really wants to know is if his wife and son managed to come back to life as well, but unfortunately, they weren't as lucky as him. Outside in the hospital corridor, a detective is on his way to meet Logan to ask him some questions. It had been over 24 hours since Logan was pronounced dead that he will cup, so his partner is questioning whether he is even still human at this point. The detective doesn't want to think about all that, so he just enters the room to have his interrogation. He introduces himself to Logan as Mike Morris from the FBI, while his partner introduces herself as Emma Samanda. They ask him for his help in the investigation related to the recent string of murders, of which he was the latest victim. He understands this must be a very difficult time for him, but any information he can give, like the people who did this or their motive behind doing so, would go a long way towards solving the case once and for all. Logan doesn't say anything, but he clenches his fist tightly, so he clearly knows something that is making him angry. So since he isn't ready to talk yet, Mike leaves him with his business card in case he ever wants to share anything later. He then leaves with Emma, but as they walk down the halls, he tells her that he believes Logan knows exactly who did this to him. It's just a hunch, but if he is right, then they had better take turns watching his room tonight, so Emma reluctantly agreed, although she isn't happy about the overtime sting operation she now has to do. Late into the night, Emma reports to Mike that Logan has been up on the roof, just sitting there for a while now. She won't make any moves unless Mike asks her to, but she finds his behavior strange. He is looking over the edge of the roof while thinking about what has happened to his beloved family. They killed his wife, and they killed his son. He may not have had a dog to be killed, but rage is building up in him like never before, so he pulls out a spike from his wrist and stabs himself in the shoulder with it. He begins to shake violently, but then dodges out of the way of an incoming rain of spikes from the ninjas as he was expecting them to eventually come to finish the job. They charge at him just like last time, but despite being hospitalized, his movements are much sharper than they were when he was first attacked, so he's able to quickly dispatch all the ninjas that have come after him. Even pulling out some ninjutsu to turn into a cloud of black smoke and beheading eight ninjas at once, Emma can't believe what she has just witnessed, so she does the smart thing and tries to leave, however, Logan was already on to her spying on him, so as she is leaving, she gets backhanded into a concussion. He then steps over her body and towards the remaining ninja army that are here to claim his life. He takes calm, cool, and collected steps while he casually slicing up the ninjas who are now attacking him in single file for some reason. After he has killed a bunch of them, he throws the sword into the elevator button and picks up a staff one of the ninjas was using before using it to ram the remaining ninjas into the elevator with him. His vision is blurry, but that isn't stopping him from massacring these ninjas while they are trapped with him in the elevator. By the time the elevator door opens on the bottom floor, Logan is standing on a pile of corpses, and you know this ninja is regretting his career path right now. We don't see what he does to them. But by the time Mike had come in to find out why Emma wasn't answering her phone, he saw the pile of dead bodies, while Logan is elsewhere finishing off the last one. The only person left is the ninja leader who personally killed his wife and son. So Logan is even angrier than he was before as he charges in, and the two clash swords. The leader then uses a wire to catch Logan and throw him around, but he breaks free to continue the clash. It was looking like the two were evenly matched in skill, but then Logan used his smoke ability again and managed to stab the leader through the abdomen once. And from there, it was all downhill for the ninja leader as he gets stabbed repeatedly and tossed on the floor to be finished off. But before he does, Logan asks him how they managed to find him here even after all the precautions he took. The ninja squad leader smugly answers that no matter where he hides or how many times he changes his face, it will always be able to find him because there is no escaping them. Logan realizes the guy is right, so he takes off the face-changing mask he had on and finishes him off. Afterward, he goes to see the corpse of his wife and son one last time and faces his failure to protect them. He later returns to his farmhouse and digs into his wall to recover the tools from the life he left behind long ago. He and his wife had moved here and changed their identities to escape their bold life, even had a son and lived in peace for a few years. But the past came back to bite him. So he burns down his house along with the painful memories of his family and prepares to that old life and make them pay for what they've done. Long ago in Japan, the ninja clan worked in secrecy to maintain order within the country, with one main rule that people within the organization must never share any of the skills learned here with foreigners under any circumstances. However, due to events involving a plane and two towers, they changed their policy to maintain order throughout the entire world, so by proxy, 
was now allowed by the organization for foreigners to learn their secrets. The goal of benefiting Japan always remained. Under the new management, anyone who disobeyed orders or disliked the new way of doing things was deemed a defector and would be excommunicado. They would subsequently be hunted down and eliminated, just as we've seen happen to Logan, whose real name is apparently Hagen. He snaps out of his nightmare and we see he had been torturing the ninja team leader to get information, but the strain on his body was too great, so he ends up collapsing on the ground. Just then, he hears the familiar voice of an old geezer who he had never thought you would see again in this lifetime. The old man is a Dr. Hagen had been going to back in the day, so having heard about what happened to his family, he offers his condolences. He also asks why Hagen isn't wearing his disguise right now, so Hagen informs him that the organization has found a way to find them even with the disguises on, so he's now completely useless. That's bad news, but changing topics, the old man complains about Hagen always being beaten up so badly when he sees him. But then again, he is a doctor, so Hagen only comes to see him when he is injured. The old man takes a look at his arm and can tell that he used his secret art of stark awareness during a fight, which left his arm in its current bruised state. He warns him that if he uses it again, it would be the end of him. But then he takes a look at Hagen's back, and with a wound like that, he should have been dead already. Personally, he doesn't understand why he is alive either, nor does he even want to be alive, but whether it was dumb luck or something keeping him alive, Hagen just wants to get out there and get his revenge. The doctor tells him that even with how strong his body is, it would still take him at least a week before he could make a full recovery, but Hagen doesn't have one week to wait, he just needs to be able to move again and then he will go out and get some answers from those uninvited guests. And after he does, he will hunt down every last person that was involved in what happened to his family. The doctor thinks it is crazy to attempt to take them down by himself, but that's not going to stop him from trying. The doctor agrees to do as he requested, so Hagen is knocked out with a needle, and by the time he wakes up, he has been successfully patched up enough to restore bodily functions, and he even left a care package of essentials behind for him. Hagen takes a look in his backpack and finds that business card that Mike left for him back when he was in the hospital, but he'll leave that for later because right now he's got a date with that ninja team leader. He begins stabbing him in the gut with a knife several times, causing the ninja great pain, but he says this isn't going to be enough to break him into giving up information because ninjas are training to never crack under torture. Hagen knows that to be true, but this isn't about getting information out of him, this is nothing more than revenge for what he has done. So Hagen spends hours stabbing the ninja over and over again until it is morning. Two days have passed of being stabbed over and over and Hagen is finally ready to end it so he splashes the guy with a jerry can of gasoline which wakes him up. The ninja starts trying to mess with Hagen by recounting how much he enjoyed stabbing his wife to death. Hagen cuts him off and lets him know that he is about to be plunged into the depths of hell and even if his heart stops, he won't be freed from the torment that awaits him. He then drops the match and watches as the fire engulfs and burns his body into a mass of char. In the FBI headquarters, Mike is pissed because he is getting taken off the investigation despite all that happened. Emma got knocked out and the entire roof was covered in a bunch of human-flavored red paint, so something illegal clearly happened there. Still, the chief says there is nothing they can do since they don't know who that blood belongs to and the surveillance cameras weren't working either, so there's no way to know what happened. More importantly, the head people at the top told them to give up on the investigation, so they have to do as they were told. Mike is still defiant though because they do know what happened there since Emma saw the entire thing with her own eyes and knows Logan was attacked by assassins. However, his boss corrects him and says he is sure Emma will now agree that she hallucinated the entire thing. Mike goes over to Emma and yells at her for selling out and agreeing to pretend none of that happened. But she had no intention of giving up on the case, she just acted like it to get management off her back. In reality, she's been doing research into the past of Logan on the company computer, which may not be a good idea if you're trying to hide it from management, but she did find something strange. Logan, as well as his wife and kids, were all using aliases as there are no records of them ever existing. Something shady is definitely going on, and Mike is going to get to the bottom of it. Meanwhile, Hagen has begun to travel around the country to locate to look for the people he wishes to take revenge on. He goes to several different locations, but he comes up empty-handed each time no matter where he looks. Eventually, he ends up in a bar located in the middle of nowhere, where there is no such thing as body cams so the police out here are free to do all the harassment and extortion they wish. The bar owner gives them all the money he has, but they aren't satisfied and start beating him up when the other cop notices Hagen sitting there, quietly drinking his beer, and he decides it is time to add a new victim. He starts accusing Hagen of having stolen the motorcycle he drove here, so naturally, he will have to take the bike, as well as everything Hagen has in his wallet. 
Hagen tries to ignore him so he won't have to get involved, but the cop starts getting violent so he has to put him in his place and knocks the guy out in one second. He then turns to leave, but the other cop wasn't smart enough to know when to back off, so he tried to hit Hagen with his baton and take a look at this. Hagen didn't even touch the dude, but the force from his punch was enough to launch him back into the wall. Now that that's taken care of, he heads out and remembers that business card Mike gave him, so he may decide to give him a call after all. Over in the FBI office, Mike is complaining about Emma spending so much time playing with that VR headset she has, but she has an excuse to do this because there have been drug deals taking place in games like Minecraft, so she's got to do a thorough investigation on this now, otherwise, they won't have time to looking into the case with Logan anymore. Just then, Mike receives a call from an unknown number, and when he answers, it is Hagen on the other end who introduces himself as Joe Logan. Mike immediately chucks a book at Emma so she'll get off the game and start tracking where the call is coming from, and in the meantime, he'll try to keep him on the call long enough to triangulate his position. He knows Logan is just an alias, so he asks who he really is, but Hagen wishes to talk in person and is already onto their trick of trying to track him down, so he destroys the phone and calls back with another one. He tells them this is their last chance to gain his cooperation, so he tells Mike to pick a location for them to meet. Mike is surprised he is willing to let him choose the location, but since it's his choice, he picks a local Chinese restaurant. That night, Hagen heads into town and climbs a building to scope out the location Mike picked to make sure it isn't an ambush. Meanwhile, Mike has just entered and informs the owner that he's about to use his restaurant as a meeting place with a guy who single-handedly wiped out an assassin army. He thinks this place is perfect, because the business is so slow that there are barely ever any people here. But he's going to need the owner to take a long walk while he is here so they can be alone. The owner doesn't like the idea, but once Hagen shows up, he takes one look at him and knows he doesn't want to be around for what happens next. But before he goes, he tells Mike that he is going to be liable for anything he breaks in the restaurant. Mike wants to see Hagen's face to make sure he's the same guy, but he isn't willing to go that far, so he is about to leave. Mike calls him back and tells him to grab a seat so they can talk. He's taking a big risk coming here so they can talk, but he isn't really interested in talking right now, he just wants to get some information on who the people who killed his wife and son were. However, Mike was never going to negotiate with Logan in the first place as he gets up and points his gun at him. Logan is still calmly waiting in his seat because he knows that the gun isn't going to do any damage to him, but Mike still believes he has the high ground and orders Logan to get on the ground. Just then, the door opens and a delivery guy walks in to grab an order, so Mike is forced to put the gun away for now, yet Logan is still sitting there patiently waiting for Mike to finish so they can keep talking. The door opens again, but this time it's not a regular delivery driver and this bootleg door dash employee dashes at Hagen to take him out, but gets stopped as Hagen turns around and chucks a chair at him. He then pulls out a knife as the two begin fighting in the middle of the restaurant. Mike is still standing there and threatening the two of them to stop with his gun, and I've got to give him credit because he managed to actually dodge one of the attacks from the door dasher. However, as Mike fires his gun at him, he deflects the bullets and comes in close, so it's not looking good for Mike's chances of survival. Luckily, Hagen still needs him alive, so he gets saved from getting delivered to the afterlife. The door dasher has a second set of hands for twice the fighting capacity, so Hagen pulls the same trick and uses his smoke technique to create two extra sets of hands on his back, and with the extra attack speed, he's able to overwhelm the door dasher and knock him back. In a turn of events, there was another door dasher hiding in the backpack, so Hagen now has to face the two of them. He gets Mike to safety first, then he uses some fire to distract the two before pinning one's hand to the wall and stabbing his head with a knife. The other one has already had his head chopped off, so now that the battle is over, Mike has given up on arresting Hagen, and just wants to know who he really is. Hagen explains to him that he is a ninja, as well as all the people behind those murders that were happening recently. Mike had heard rumors about ninjas on the streets, but he never thought they could actually be real. Soon after, the shop gets hit by a drive-by shooting that is trying to kill off all the witnesses, so they hide behind a table for cover, and I don't know what that is made of, but it's gotta be good if it took heavy gunfire and is still in one piece. The shooters then pull out an RPG, so Hagen and Mike run to hide in the back as they fire and leave. By the time the dust has settled, Hagen has disappeared and Mike is left with several questions and a bill for the repair of the restaurant. He goes over to inspect the weapon of the door dasher, and he has no idea what kind of weapon tech they have to be able to slice through his body armor so cleanly. Just then, an advert for the world's leading tech company begins to play, so it looks like they have a hand in all of this. Elsewhere, the head of the clan receives a report that Hagen is unfortunately still alive, so he's going to have to work harder if he wants him dead. 
In an art museum on the other side of the country, we watch as the exhibits are painted red with blood as there are several killings occurring simultaneously this night. Outside, a man is being carted away by his security guards as they try to ensure his safety by getting him as far away from here as possible to escape the calamity that is coming for him. It looks like they may be in the clear, so while in the back seat of the car, the man prays to God to save him from the demons that are after him. And he wasn't joking when he said demons because moments later, these wrinkly white hands pop out from behind his car seats and proceed to snap the necks of the two guards next to him before digging their nails into his head and forcefully disconnecting him from life. The car ends up spinning out of control from all the chaos and crashing into a tree. Moments later, the car bursts into flames, so we know with certainty that everyone in there has died. This whole assassination plan was the work of this bald little midget, and he receives his next target for assassination, Hagen, and he is way too excited to do this. We later see him having a fancy dinner with his boss, and with a full view of his face, we see that he is not actually bald, but he might as well be with that abomination of a haircut. He tells his client that the last job he went on was unbelievably boring since he wasn't even able to get hard as he watched the bodies burn to ash. He needs something more invigorating, so he asks that the boring jobs to the others so he can have some fun. Yamaji is having none of his blabber and tells him he is to kill who he is told to kill as the job isn't meant to be fun. Seeing that he got off to a bad start, the midget backtracks and changes the subject by asking Yamaji if it is really necessary to keep the ninja customs and spend so many resources going after the defecting ninjas, but Yamaji insists that it is a necessary course of action since those defectors are no longer considered ninja, and thus must be exterminated in order to ensure their secret arts are never shared with the public. The midget has to admit that he finds Hagen to be very tempting as a target. He was one of the greatest ninjas ever known to Japan and has mastered countless fighting arts. He is known to be merciless when it comes to killing his targets, and now the midget gets the honor of killing him personally. Yamaji informs him that they have already successfully killed Hagen once before, that he is still alive and well so they suspect he may have used some kind of secret ninja art to bring himself back to life. The ninja secret arts are special techniques that only the old ninjas could use, but that just makes the midget even more excited to face him. The organization needs to make sure they finish him off next time. So preparations are being made at this very moment to ensure he is killed properly this time, but the midget thinks it would be much better if he just left the killing of Hagen for him to handle alone since he is practically edging to get a good lick at him. He begins to leave on his booster seat when he remembers something he wanted to ask about and proceeds to inquire about another ninja called the Reaper. We get a look at this reaper as he has just finished taking out a bunch of ninjas and faces his former master. The master calls out to Zai and tells him brandishing his blade without pride and what he does is nothing more than violence. Zai has been killing the defected ninjas for the organization who also happen to have been his former comrades but the organization is corrupt to the core, so the only reason they are going through so much effort to kill the ninjas that defected is because they fear them. The former master prepares his sword for the inevitable clash and continues by saying the ninjas who chose to hold onto their pride like him and Defect will not fall to the likes of them, and the fact that they failed to kill Hagen is proof of that. The tension rises as the two stare each other down, waiting for someone to make the first move. The master breaks the deadlock first and unleashes a powerful strike of wind which should have been unavoidable, however despite using his secret art, Zai remains unharmed and emerges from the dust with his casual demeanor. The master doesn't know how he managed to dodge that strike, but doesn't matter because he can just perform another one. However, before he redoes his strike, he takes a second look at Zai and realizes this dude isn't holding his sword anymore. And I don't know when he did it, but the sword in question is currently in the middle of the master's sternum. His mask is also destroyed and the master can't even be mad about it because he got beaten before he even knew it. He just says I guess I'm dead as he falls to the ground, saying if he falls into the pits of hell, he'll be waiting for the day Zai joins him down there. Back to the meeting with Yamaji, the midget thinks the reaper must be wanting to go after someone as powerful as Higgin as well, and that may be true. But Yamaji has already issued an order to him forbidding any kind of engagement with Higgin, so they are not allowed to fight at all. Meanwhile, at the police department, we see how badly Mike screwed over the Chinese restaurant guy because after the destruction that broke out there as a result of his meeting, the police department decided to frame the owner as part of a Chinese money laundering scheme to pin the blame on somebody. Mike knows the accusations are a complete lie, but this guy couldn't care less what upper management tells him to lie about as long as he gets to keep his job. There is nothing Mike can do in this situation, and he soon gets called out by his boss. They head out to a lake in the nearby park where his boss tells him to keep his nose out of this stuff. He won't be able to keep his out of trouble if he keeps digging so deep, and he has only got a few more years before retirement so he should just keep his head down until then so he can sit back and drink whiskey while fishing for the rest of his days. His boss will even gift him a state-of-the-art fishing rod, 
But Mike isn't too receptive to the GIF as he knows it's probably going to be an AUSA product, and he doesn't want to give up on finding the truth. His boss is done talking to him and does the only thing he can think of to keep Mike from sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. He tells him not to come into work anymore since he's clearly too tired to make any wise decisions, but he isn't fired just on paid leave until his retirement day. This is the best advice he can give him as someone who used to be partners with him. Elsewhere in an abandoned building, we see Hagen as he is blacksmithing something and hammering away. As he stares blankly into the flames, flashes of the memory of his dead family fill his mind, and it is so overwhelming that he ends up puking his guts out in the corner over there. After the panic attack subsides, he steadies his breathing and calms down before noticing that someone is approaching. A car pulls up to the building and once it is parked, Mike walks out with a box full of stuff. He complains that this place was way too remote for him to find with his GPS, so it took him a lot of effort to get here. But Hegan likes it that way since that means no one would ever come here. The two head inside and have a discussion about the blades that the attackers were using back in the restaurant. After analysis, it seems like they were made with a special alloy, and this special alloy is only produced by Euse, so it is plain to see that there is some kind of connection between them and the ninjas that attacked. Mike says he will do a little digging to see if there is anything he can find, but Euse is most definitely very dangerous since they have the entire FBI under their control and now they want to try to keep him quiet. Hagen tells Mike that they killed his family, so he is going to hunt down every last person there and make them pay for what they did. That means Hagen is planning to murder them all. But just to make things clear, Mike is still on the side of justice, so if it comes down to it, they'll have to arrest Hagen for his crimes, but with that being said, there are still a lot more dirt bags at the FBI that he's going to need to handcuff first. Mike suggests that the two form a truce so they can help each other accomplish their goals, although he had never thought he would be working with anyone as shady as an actual ninja. Hagen hands him a mug and pours him a drink from his flask to commemorate their alliance. But as Mike takes a sip, he realizes what he just drank isn't alcohol so it might have been poison, but Hagen reassures him that it was just an energy drink. Moving on, Mike brings up the fact that he has got a lead on Euse, which gets Hagen's attention. He also says he has someone on their way here who knows a thing or two about them. The door creaks open, so he thinks it must be them, but in reality, it's the duck they are going to be eating soon. That night, Emma finally arrives, but Mike is upset at her for being so late when she was meant to meet up with them at noon. She defends herself by saying she had no choice since she had to wait for a chance to leave work, and then she had to go pick up this baby, so she would get all the way out here. Mike doesn't see what's so special about her car, but Emma takes great offense to him not appreciating the greatness of her baby, so she points out that the car Mike brought is an actual piece of junk. Mike doesn't deny it, but he says the car was good enough to get him here on time, so he doesn't see what the problem could possibly be. Hagen takes a look at Emma's car and can tell that it's one of the best cars made by famous designers back in the 20th century. She is elated to see someone else understand her love for this car as well as expected of a ninja. Hagen is on edge since her knowing that means Mike must have told her, but Mike calms him down by saying Emma is a trusted friend, and also the one who analyzed the weapons for them. So she needs to be here. She has always been fascinated by ninjas, so she starts asking Hagen a ton of questions, but Mike cuts her off and says they should get back on topic since they are here to discuss Euse. She tells them to get into the car because she has something she wants to show them, so they both squeeze themselves into the back seats, however, there is very little space in there. Emma tells them to bear with it for a second while she shows them why she cares so much about this car, and it is because she has basically turned it into a moving computer, and from this car, she is able to access all the information from around the world. But the real question is, can it run Cyberpunk 2077? Anyway, Emma has researched the company, and has been able to find out that AUZ is involved in the development of military weapons, telecommunications, and entertainment. They are involved in pretty much every kind of technology imaginable, and basically, everyone in the world uses something made by them at this point. But, as with any multinational trillion dollar company, there are dark rumors surrounding the company. So far, every single opposing company leader or journalist that did anything that would put Euse in a bad spot has died in a mysterious accident. In more recent news, this man who is the leader of a conservative party in his country refused to allow any foreign companies to do business there. But his ruling was recently revoked after he died in a car accident. And the guy who replaced, who definitely isn't an AUZ spy by the way, is currently advocating for the improvement of the domestic technology in partnership with AUZ. All these convenient deaths seem suspicious, and Emma believes this is the work of the ninjas. Mike is worried about what they might be getting into if they are up against a giant company and a ninja army. 
Meanwhile, over in an AUZEA research facility, they have just begun tests for a new generator that they have been developing, and their other wireless power systems are on their way to being perfected, so AUZEA is on its way to becoming commonplace in the world, with the ultimate goal of holding a complete monopoly on all tech industries. The company president heads back to his office after meeting with the researchers, and Yagami is there to meet with him. He's happy to have a chat, but Yagami is here to settle a grievance he has with him. The drive-by that was targeted at Hagen was done by Eiuze agents because he wanted to test out his new weapons, but Yamaji doesn't like him interfering in his business even if they are meant to be business partners. Hagen and the others take a look at the figurative center of Eiuze and try to figure out how the ninjas fit into all of this. The headquarters is located in Eiuze City, where they test out all their experimental inventions. They continue looking through the information when all of a sudden Hagen pushes Mike out of the way as a sword is stabbed through the roof of the car. Emma begins driving to try to shake off their attacker, but he is still jamming the sword into the roof. Mike tries shooting at him, but it isn't doing much to stop the attacks, so Hagen takes it upon himself to stab the guy. They think they are safe now, but out of nowhere. A truck collides with them and they are sent barreling off to the side of the road. Hagen is the first to wake up and the other two are unconscious from the collision, but the battle isn't over as the attacker is standing in front of them and starts firing dozens of spikes at him. Hagen pulls Mike to safety and leaps out of the car to face the mask-wearing attacker, so the two begin to clash while dashing across the city streets. They end up on the roof of a building and the attacker whips out some tentacles robotics that it had equipped, which once locked on, all strike at Hagen until he gets struck in the back midair. He uses his ninjutsu to form extra arms in his back against and grabs the tentacles before using them to toss the attacker around. But he had even more tricks packed into his suit as he launches two missiles at Hagen. However, Hagen managed to dodge them all mid-air and uses the opening to stab the assailant through the head and drag his body to the edge of the roof before pulling off the camera on him. The midget was watching the whole thing and Hagen makes it clear that he is coming for him next. The midget is finishing up his meal and Hagen is about to leave as Mike and Emma are taken away by paramedics. But he suddenly gets a call on a throwaway phone, and it's a voice he seems to recognize. The voice tells him that he has gone through the liberty of encrypting this call so he doesn't need to worry about getting traced by it. Hagen starts by asking who this voice really is, but he won't be getting an answer so easily. First, the voice reveals that he knows Hagen is heading for Oza City, but they have a really tough multi-layered security system, so it will be impossible for him to make it in there all by himself. So for that reason, the voice wants to offer his assistance in Hagen's infiltration. Hagen isn't dumb enough to trust a voice he has only met over the phone with his life, but the voice reveals that he is also in a similar situation to Hagen's as an exiled ninja, therefore it is in his best interest to cooperate. He says he will send a location where he wishes to meet up with Hagen later, so he will leave the decision of whether or not to be trusted up to him. Mike wakes up in a hospital room after the car crash and opens a note he received from his daughter a while ago. Some years back, he was on a sting operation with another guy when his wife started calling him nonstop. Now, he could have just answered, but he thought his job was more important so tells his partner to just stay focused on the investigation, even though the eyewitness report isn't guaranteed to be true. The day ended without him finding anything, and once he returned to the office, he finally decided it was worth it to pick up his wife's call. However, what he heard next changed his life forever. His daughter was killed in a car accident by some random guy who the reports say was asleep at the wheel. His wife is devastated, and equally as upset at him for not answering his phone when something as serious as this was happening. That day, he lost both his daughter and his wife, and now the only thing he has left to comfort him is the drawing his daughter made for him while she was still alive. While he is deep in thought, Higgin interrupts him as he appears around the corner. Mike is never going to get used to how ninjas appear out of nowhere, but he has something important to share. They call in Emma as Higgin mentions the guy who said he could offer some help regarding the Oza mission. Mike isn't so convinced that this guy is actually another ninja like Higgin, but he did know information that was only passed down to the ninjas of the old organization and nobody has spoken of it since they came to this country. Emma's research also shows that the guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to Oza's security system because it is no joke. You would have to be a literal ghost to get past it without being detected at all. But if this does turn out to be a trap after all, he's just going to have to kill them all. Mike doesn't like the fact that he didn't just casually admitted to wanting to commit homicide, but he'll leave that alone for now. What's important is to discuss how they are going to make their way into Oza City. Considering the last time Mike spoke to his boss, Oza most definitely have an eye on him, so Emma thinks it might be best to call it quits right now. She may have been right when she said the best way to get to Oza's secrets would be to make it into their HQ, but she never said it was possible to do. Mike begs her to reconsider, but she's the tech girl, not a magician, so there's nothing she can do. 
However, that doesn't mean they are out of options entirely since she has found another lead in the form of a community of dark web users who have been keeping tabs on Oza's actions. From what they've seen, they believe Oza is planning to take over the world by building weapons of mass destruction. Mike initially takes it to be nothing more than a bunch of conspiracy theories, but then again, it's better to be safe than sorry. Emma manages to locate the admin of the dark web group who claims to be one of Oza's former researchers, but he is really far from here, so it will take a while to get to him. Mike says that's not going to be a problem, but he wants to go alone because Emma has done enough to help him. He doesn't want her throwing her life away on a mission like this, but he, on the other hand, has already lost everything he cared for in life, so he's got nothing to lose. However, Emma isn't backing down when they are this close to getting info on Oza. And if she's lucky, she might even be able to steal some of their cutting-edge data and sell it for millions on the black market. Since she isn't giving up, they all agree to stick together and Hayden gets up to leave until the others are ready to head out. However, before he goes, Mike asks him if he ever told his wife that he was a ninja. Hagen replies that his wife knew all about it since she was also one, the two of them just broke the ninja code of staying emotionally distant from other ninjas. That puts Mike's life into perspectives, since even a ninja like Hagen chose family over work. The head of Oza has called a meeting to discuss how to take down Hagen since he seems to be quite the formidable fighter. The little midget makes fun of him for glazing Hagen so much, but he doesn't mind glazing as much as necessary so long as he gets the data he so desperately wants. In fact, if warranted, he would be willing to have his assistant give him Gluck Gluck 9000 if it would provide decent data. And she is also willing to do anything her boss asks her to do. Jokes aside, Oza's director asks what the plan is since Hegan is most definitely going to show up here next, but he is told to rest assured since Oza City is 100% impenetrable. He doesn't like it when people use the word 100% secure because that's just begging for someone to break through. However, before he goes on, he asks Big D if he is listening to the meeting. Big is definitely listening, but he has got more pressing matters to attend to, like making sure his fade stays as fresh as possible. And if Hegan so much as dents the afro, he'll personally ensure that he dies. The midget tries to make a joke about Big D's big banana, but Yamaji has grown tired of listening to his idle chatter and uses what I can only describe as a force choke to keep him silent. He states that everyone is aware of how dangerous Hegan is by this point, so the plan remains the same. They have to learn how his technique works in order to defeat him and they can just leave Mike alone for now since he isn't much of a threat to them yet. They shouldn't make things more complicated than they need to be. The head of Oza doesn't like being ordered around, but at the same time, he agrees with everything Yamaji just said, so the meeting is adjourned. On the ride back, he asks his assistant Dilly how far she thinks Hegan will be able to make it into the city before he gets killed. It's not that he is feeling threatened by Hegan, but he is rather excited to get to see a ninja go all out. He hopes to get some really useful data from this. Meanwhile, the Reaper tells Yamaji that he would be happy to go after Hegan right now if he orders it. However, Yamaji tells him to sit tight because he plans to send the others in first so they can force Hegan to reveal his technique. Their deaths will be inconsequential to the organization, and it is only a matter of time before they achieve their true goals. And as he speaks, his operatives have broken into a building where they took out all the guards and stole some top-secret government documents. And after they had completed their mission, they simply faded into the night. We now see a flashback to the night Hegan was acknowledged by the ninja organization and was given a name of his ninja name. This is proof of the three's skill and power as ninja, so they should take great pride in them. From that moment on, they were called Hegan, Zai, and Mari, but that was not all they were going to receive as part of their ceremony. They would also be given special techniques which they were not permitted to share with anyone, even among themselves. After the ceremony was completed, they all sat down for the evening. Mary seemed to be really happy to have a name, but Zai finds it hard to get used to. Having a name means they are no longer expendable ninjas who cease to exist once they are killed. Now, they will always be able to remember each other and the bond they have formed. To commemorate the occasion, the three share a drink together and laugh as Hegan accidentally chokes on his. Some time passes, and they are sent on a mission where more random security guards have just been killed so they can infiltrate the house of an important person. The man fires a gun at them, but we all know guns are basically useless against them, so he ends up getting stabbed through the head as they enter the bedroom. Mary at the time notices something over in the closet, so she goes to check and finds the man's wife and child hiding. Now, normal protocol is to murder any witnesses on sight, but Mary was having second thoughts about killing the child, and that single moment of hesitation was enough for the woman to unload a full clip into her body. That forced Mary's hand to stab her in the neck, but she was already severely wounded, and is about to go down as the first ninja to be taken down by Gun no Jutsu. Hegan came to check up on her, just as more security guards began to unload more rounds in their direction. So he threw a smoke grenade and jumped out the window while carrying her. He emerges later with Mary, who is unconscious from being underwater for so long, 
so he gives her CPR until she regains consciousness. Afterwards, they took shelter in a nearby cave where Mary tells him to leave her behind for the sake of the mission. He then refuses to do so, so she is prepared to end her life right here due to the shame of failing her mission and getting it with a gun. Fortunately, he can notice soon enough to allow himself to catch the blade inches away from her neck. She reminds him of the ninja code to not get emotionally attached even to allies, but Hegan already decided to break that code the day he met her. The two then share a kiss together, hours later, Xi finds them bundled up in a corner of the cave. And that was the moment their problems with the organization started. Back to the present, Mike is trying to get a hold of Hegan, as he's on his way to meet the source they found on the dark web. However, he gets a phone call from his boss at the same time. He isn't happy with what Mike has been up to recently. But he is free to do what he wants since he isn't assigned any cases right now. However, the case is different with Emma since she still has to report to her direct boss. This means she can't accompany him anymore, which is fine since Mike didn't want to drag her into this in the first place. But before they go their separate ways, she asks if he happens to be hungry by any chance. Meanwhile, Hegan is contacted by the mysterious exiled ninja who is glad he made the decision to accept his help. First, he wants Hegan to understand exactly how Oza's security system works. It functions entirely on their independently developed technology and checks in advance if vehicles approaching have permission to enter. If any uninvited guests are detected via the scan, then the drones will immediately open fire. Additionally, the airspace above the city is entirely covered in an electromagnetic barrier that only allows rain to pass through. Therefore, entering from above ground will be impossible. For that reason, Hegan will be entering through the underground facility that they use to manage all the sensors they have built throughout the city. There are security cameras as well as laser traps and armed mercenaries that patrol the sections, so to ensure the plan goes smoothly, he must avoid any and all combat no matter what. If he manages to make it past them, he will reach the barrier around the city, at which point the voice will work his magic and turn it off for 5 seconds so he will be able to get in. Over at a diner, Emma and Mike grab a bite to eat, and Emma lets Mike know that while he may not be the best mentor, she has to admit that he has taught her a lot, so while they may be working apart for now, she wants him to make sure he stays in good health. Meanwhile, Hegan has arrived at the edge of Oza City and is informed that the voice guy has managed to hack into all the internal security cameras, so they should have about 8 minutes before they get noticed. Hegan makes his move and begins running through the underground facility while dodging all the hired mercenaries as instructed. He comes across the laser security system and begins performing highly accurate gymnastics to evade detection, however, a bead of sweat flies off his face and triggers the laser anyway, so the whole plan is effectively ruined. They are now aware of his presence and begin sending out soldiers to intercept him. Hegan deals with them quickly and continues running as he comes up to the barrier, but just as the barrier is brought down, Zai shows up in front of him and the two stare each other down. Hegan states that Mary is dead asking if the kill order was placed by Yamaji, so he knows who to go after for revenge. Zai chooses not to answer, but tells Hegan that there is nowhere for him to hide. Eventually, he will be killed for his crime of disobeying the organization. Mike has just pulled up to the address of the former Oza researcher he was looking for, but it looks far too run down to be housing someone who worked for a powerful company like Oza. While he was indeed an employee there, Emma informs Mike that the guy wasn't all that respected as a researcher, and he didn't really contribute much to their development. However, if he went through all the trouble of finding a hideout in this dump, then he must know at least something useful. Mike is skeptical, but since Emma thinks it's a good idea, he decides to head in and meet the guy anyway. Emma also tells him that it is almost guaranteed that the FBI is keeping tabs on him for snooping too deep into this, so he should refrain from contacting her unless it is an emergency. Afterwards, Mike enters the abandoned arcade where he finds a man passed out drunk on a table. He sits down next to him, and once the guy finally notices him, he reveals that he knows his name is Jason Cardenas. Back at Oza City, they have realized that an error in the system made the barrier go down for 5 seconds, but considering Hegan's lack of hesitation once it went down, it must have been planned. They still don't know what caused the actual error, but there is reason to believe that Hegan is getting help from someone within Oza City. The midget doesn't care about any of the details as long as they can still be Hegan, but Yamaji says they should just stick to the plan since it would be reckless to attack him randomly. To this, the midget proposes another plan and suggests that they just let him enter the city without resistance. They have all their forces there with them, so it won't matter what secret technique he possesses if he gets overwhelmed before he can use it. Some are opposed to the idea since any collateral damage will reflect poorly in Oza, but Joseph likes the sound of getting to see an all-out battle so he says he will take the heat for any damage cause. Since they have permission, Dilly suggests that they lead Hegan to the test room. 
Meanwhile, Hegan is hiding out in one of the tunnels when he receives news from his contact that the executives have decided to let him into the city without a fight. Of course, they plan to ambush him and will deploy several of their most skilled ninjas so he shouldn't fall for it, otherwise he will be killed. The voice informs him that he should make his move at 7 p.m. since the city has planned a parade as a cover for their fight with him. Over with Mike, Jason asks him if he is here to extort money from him by threatening to put him to Oza, but Mike has no intention of doing that. He simply wants some help with an investigation, so if Jason tells him what he knows, he'll leave him alone and act like they never met in the first place. Jason, however, is more worried about the fact Mike was able to find him in the first place. And if Mike was able to get info about this place, then it's only a matter of time before Oza finds him as well. Mike takes a walk around the room and notices an old game in the middle of the room. But it's not the game he's interested in, but rather what is under the game, so he asks Jason to move it so he can see what is underneath. In Oja City, the festival has just begun, and Hegan is making his move to enter the city. He is being watched by all the organization leaders who anticipated his approach, and as he enters the sewer, he finds himself set against an army of ninjas. Mike makes his way into Jason's secret room where he has set up a whole secret server room for his hacking needs. He takes a seat in his chair and begins ranting about how he will bring Oza to the ground after how they treated him. On paper, it says he voluntarily resigned from his position, but in reality, he got hounded by the company until he was forced to quit. He can understand Jason's frustrations, but from how he is acting, he may have been fired for his personality. Still, the fact that he was able to set up all this just for the sake of getting revenge on Oza proves that he was quite skilled at his job. Jason is almost certain that Oza is involved in some really shady business, but no one ever believes him when he says that, so he decided to dig up dirt on them and put it out there for the world to see. The reason no one believes him is probably because he looks crazy, but Mike knows firsthand that Oza is not the most law-abiding company, so he believes Jason when he says they are up to no good. He wants to bring Oza down just as much as Jason, so he asks if he would be able to hack into their servers from here. Jason is hesitant to agree since Oza's security is no joke, and if he were to try to get in, they may be able to track him down here. But Mike assures him that he will be able to keep him safe. In Hegan's end, he's beating his way through the army of ninja and making it look easy. He uses some explosives to create some cover and continues running, while slicing his way through more of the ninjas. He then leaps over a bunch of them and grabs one that was separated from the group. After using the guy's body as a meat shield, Hegan stuffs his mouth full of more explosives and then fades into the darkness before the bombs go off. Jason is working his computer genius magic and is trying to gain access to their servers. Unfortunately, it is beyond his capabilities to do something like take down all their servers, but Mike says that's fine since all they need is to get info from the server. Once Jason has gotten in, they access some of the technical department's servers and find some research reports from their latest experiments. Although it's not the illegal stuff they were looking for, so they keep looking until they find the system source code, but that's still not going to be useful. Jason tries looking elsewhere, but even after doing jazz hands over the keyboard, his access keeps getting denied. Eventually, he gives up on trying to access the top secret files and just takes a look in one of the internal servers to see if anyone messed up and left some files out, and fortunately, someone did just that. A folder named Bound was left out which contained a list of fake names likely for the spy operatives that they are planting in organizations all over the world. But as Mike looks a little closer at the list, he notices something really worrying. Emma's name is on that list as well. He doesn't get much time to think about it though as alarms start going off as Oza has caught on to their hacking scheme and blocked Jason's access. Jason's security system also lets him know that they have some gun-wielding soldiers after them. They make their way into the server room and have their guns ready to fire at the slightest movement. Mike and Jason are hiding behind a counter when Mike turns on the switch to the game machines and that draws the mercenaries' attention as they immediately open fire on them. And while they did that, Mike and Jason made a run for it to Mike's car and drove away before they could be shot. The only explanation for how they were found so easily is that the FBI must have told Oza about his plans here. So mercenaries were sent out to silence both he and Jason. Meanwhile, Hegan also has to deal with some of Oza's mercenaries, but unlike Mike, he is someone they need to fear. After a smoke canister is thrown their way, we can't see what happened. But it's safe to say those three are no more. Three other mercenaries open fire into the smoke cloud, but they get hit with spikes to the throat as Hegan makes his way forward. But while he was doing all that, Mike and Jason are fleeing for their lives from the mercenaries after them. Mike tries to make a call while Jason is freaking out over his hideout, having been compromised, but Emma isn't answering and they've got bigger problems to deal with as the mercenaries are catching up. They begin firing at the car, but Jason isn't able to drive any faster than this since the car's a piece of junk. 
Mike decides to hang outside the window and shoot a couple rounds of cover fire while Jason sees a truck coming towards them and has the brilliant ideas to nearly crash into it so it takes out the mercenary cars instead. One of the Mertz cars is taken out, but the other is still closing in on them so Mike tells Jason to slow down and get behind him. As he does, Mike then takes aim and headshots the mercenaries on his first shot, but Jason was celebrating too soon as they still had to deal with the one in the driver's seat. Mike fires a shot through the window, and as a result the car spins out of control and crashes. Back to Hegan, he is currently walking up to these two minimum wage security guards who just witnessed him take down a whole army. They aren't getting paid enough to deal with this shit, so they make the smart decision to just leave him alone. Hegan gets in the elevator, and as he is heading to the top floor, he has flashbacks to his family, reminding him of the reason he has for doing all this. He arrives in a large open room, and as he steps in, he finds himself surrounded by the midget and mech suit, which definitely isn't compensating for anything. The others are impressed he made it this far in the first place, but this is as far as he goes. Joseph is watching all this unfold from his home gym in his house, and Yamaji is watching from a helicopter circle in the test center. Once Egan sees Yamaji, he immediately starts charging towards him, but he gets body checked by one of the ninjas. He nearly gets his face pounded in, but manages to dodge at the last second and perform a kick to counter. However, the armor is too tough, so he isn't able to do any damage and gets his leg grabbed and body thrown into the air, where he gets hammer fisted by Big D. The jumping isn't stopping anytime soon, so Hegan uses his secret art to conceal his presence. They thought he would attack them, but rather he threw some bombs at the window and used a grappling hook to go after Yamaji. Before he could make it all the way up, the line gets shot off, so Hegan ends up falling to the ground and has his spotlight shone on him. Hegan lays there for a moment and thinks about his family one last time as he has accepted that he may die here. But if he's going to go out, he's not going out without a fight, so he prepares to use that special technique again, even though he knows it will eventually kill him if he uses it now. He pulls the needle out of his arm and stabs himself. But in that same moment, he gets hit by Dilly and is sent flying to the others. They were about to attack again. But Hegan turned the tables mid-fight and stabbed one of them in the head, yet the armor still protects him from fatal damage. He throws another smoke grenade to block their vision, and with his increased speed, they are unable to keep track of his movements at all. He continues stabbing them in an attempt to find a weak point in their armor, but so far it looks like it is really impenetrable. Hegan is prepared to use another one of his secret techniques to break through, but before he can finish the hand sight, he gets stabbed through the chest by a few spikes. After that, it all went downhill for Hegan, as he was hit with several kicks from the midget and got tossed around like a soccer ball, until he was basically lifeless. Just when it looked like it was over, Zai appears and walks over to Hegan who still tries to fight, but doesn't have it in him to do much more than throw weak punches. Zai knocks him back to the ground and tells him it is time to finish things once and for all, so he pulls out his sword and raises it to behead Hegan. Hegan has accepted his fate and no longer has the will to fight back, but just before he could be killed, the ninja in the pink suit stepped in and saved him. No one can believe what just happened, but before the others can step in to stop her from helping Hegan, their suits are turned off by an EMP device she had planted earlier. She then grabs Hegan and jumps off the side of the roof while throwing a bomb at Zai to keep him off their trail. On Mike's end, we see that Jason is trying to carry him to safety after he got shot, but the extent of his wounds are unknown and with Hegan, he was just barely conscious enough to understand what just happened, but even if he survived thanks to this unknown ninja, what will he do now that he has failed to get his revenge? Zai and the others walk over to the edge and look over in utter shock at what their teammate has just done, but the midget doesn't seem to care that the pink ninja helped Hegan because it just means there are two people to hunt now. The media has already begun their cover-up on the situation here, claiming the explosions from last night were just a happy little accident. However, the operatives on the ground receive a coded message informing them of the betrayal of one of their ninjas, and the fact that she is currently on the run with Hegan. Yamaji wants them all to make sure that neither she nor Hegan are able to leave the Oza city. A little while later, Hegan wakes up in a capsule, but before he can start moving, the female ninja from before warns him that he needs time to heal, even with the bonus of this nanomachine technology. She knows he must be wondering why she would save him in the first place, but it all begins to make sense once she removes her mask and reveals that she is actually Emma. She apologizes for lying to him about her identity, and this isn't even her real face to begin with. Hegan asks her if she was ordered to get close to him, and she confirms that his assumptions are correct. She reveals that the chieftain had sent her on a special mission involving the fact that Hegan died and was revived by his secret technique. She was tasked with uncovering the truth behind his technique, and was told to operate under the assumption that Hegan could revive himself indefinitely. 
Secret techniques are only ever used in the heat of battle, so she only wanted to observe him and got close under the guise of Emma. But that's not all either as she reveals that she is also the mysterious voice who has helped him infiltrate Oza. He asked if Mike is a ninja as well, but she denies it, saying he is just a regular civilian. Higa doesn't understand why she would work under orders of the organization, but also work to betray them on the sidelines. She explains that she obviously has her own goals in all this, but she won't be able to achieve them on her own. Also, she warns him that if he were to fight the lieutenants again, he will definitely be killed. Their battle suits are simply too strong for him to go up against, and as he has already experienced firsthand, his techniques are of little use in a fight against them. But that doesn't mean all hope is lost since he just needs to even the playing field and he can do that by using their own tech against them. Back at HQ, Yemiji receives news that one of the experimental battle suits that they had in storage has gone missing. It seems like the traitor had it prepared in advance so she could steal it as she saved Higan. Still, Yamaji doesn't think this will be an issue since they can still handle Higan even if he has a new suit. Meanwhile, all his operatives are performing a systematic sweep of the area while looking for the fugitives. Emma is currently typing away on her computer to configure the Gusoku gear for Higan. It is specially made to be able to work with all sorts of ninja techniques and integrates 600 years of ninja expertise with the cutting-edge technology of Oza. She was actually also one of the members of the development team for the suits, and as such she knows that this experimental one is the top of the line. She just needs to add some finishing touches to it and Hegan will be able to use it to its full potential. But it's a race against the clock since the organization might just find them first, then they're as good as dead. As the organization continues their search elsewhere, Mike wakes up in a bed next to a panicked Jason who yells at him for failing to provide the protection he had sworn he would. Mike is still feeling the after effects of getting shot, so he just rolls back over in bed, but then Jason informs him that he has been out for 10 days straight. He got one of his doctor friends to come and patch Mike up, but it came at heavy cost to Mike's wallet. This is a swanky beach house which is not owned by Jason, but the owners won't be back for a while, so they should be safe to hide out here in the meantime. Mike realizes that if they got found and attacked so quickly, then they must have been following him since before he even left the city. But this also lets him know that they must be getting close to finding something Ozo wants to keep hidden. Emma is still trying to finish up the battle suit, but she lacks an adequate power source to get it up and running. The arc reactors that would normally serve as its power source are currently all still in the Oza HQ, but heading back over there would be a literal death sentence without this suit. And that leaves her with only one other option. Meanwhile, Hegan is having a flashback to some time he had spent with his wife years ago, and he takes inspiration from something she said back then. Over at HQ, the operatives have completed their search on all the zones except one, and now that they think about it, the power consumption there has been 10 times what it usually is, leading them to believe that some heavy equipment must be in operation over there. Since they've officially narrowed down the location of the traders, Big D volunteers himself to go handle the situation since he thinks it will be fun. Emma has just finished getting the armor plating on the armor up and running, but there's still a lot left to do. The updated Gusoku armor is Kamui, and it is an entirely new design built from scratch and designed to achieve the highest battle performance imaginable. As such, it works differently from other suits as this one needs to be connected directly to the brain of the user. They will then be able to respond to the mental image the user thinks of immediately, giving it a reaction time which is leagues ahead of anything the other suits could accomplish. The more intensely you visualize your actions, the more strength and speed the suit will be able to put into execution. It works based on the willpower of the user, but in order to make this work, it'll need to be put into a deep sleep state, in which you won't be able to wake up at all, even if he gets stabbed through the heart again. She wants to make it abundantly clear to him that the next time he dies, he won't be able to come back. She knows this for a fact since the one who made him able to be revived was her. She shows him a mask, revealing that she was there on the night of the initial attack on his family. She had used her own secret technique to completely freeze his cells by striking a special pathway. This is what allows him to survive being stabbed through his heart, but once the technique is used on someone once, it can never be used again since the pathways will be permanently closed. After hearing this, Hagen only feels rage because she could have easily saved his wife and son as well. So why didn't she? He would have been fine with dying if it meant they would stay alive. Emma doesn't answer him and instead activates the neural link which knocks Hagen out. Just then, she gets an alert which means her hideout has just been infiltrated and a quick look at the security cameras lets her know that the intruders are not bigged and a couple of his ninjas are heading her way. 
He finds a door down the path and begins using a laser tool to cut his way through it. But once he finally gets through the door, all he finds waiting for him on the other side is a bunch of explosives which Emma had planted in a decoy location. Emma is glad they fell for the decoy, so she should have a bit of extra time to complete Hegan's synchronization now. Unfortunately, she was wrong as the midget has somehow found her. She asks how he managed to find her. And although he may be small, he's still got a big brain so he was able to deduce that since there were barely any traces of them within the city, then they must either have died or have been constantly on the move. And since he knew there was no way they'd die, he was able to just track every vehicle in the city. And since she went into hiding, there has only been one that hasn't stopped moving at all. The synchronization rate of Hegan's suit is still only at 10%. So she needs to find a way to stall the midget until Hegan is ready. She makes a run for her computer as the midget was about to blast Hegan, and she runs a program that makes the truck they are in tip over. This provided her with enough time to put on her own battle suit, so she heads out of the truck to face the midget. Midget is personally pretty excited that he gets to fight someone else in a suit like this, so he pulls out one of his add-ons and prepares to engage in combat with her. Meanwhile, Mike is attempting to contact Emma, but she isn't picking up for obvious reasons. He tells Jason that their next move is to track down all the people on that list, but Jason doesn't understand how Mike expects him to be able to do something like that. He can't go home anymore since his cover has been blown, and without access to his computers, he can't hack into anything anymore. Computers aren't exactly Mike's area of expertise, so he can't really help. Emma would be able to handle something like getting a computer, but then Mike realizes that he knows exactly where to find a really good computer. Back in Oza City, the clash between Emma and the midget is getting heated, and Emma seems to be on the losing end here. However, she still has more cards to play, so she pulls out several hands and virtual keyboards, and proceeds to hack her way into some of the Oza systems so she can take control of a bunch of machines. She then starts throwing trucks and drone strikes at the midget, and calls him out for being a disgrace to everything an ninja should be. The midget doesn't deny what she says, since it's all true. In fact, he came here without telling any one of the others at the organization that he had found their location. Emma still calls him a failure of a ninja and a short freak. Unfortunately, he is into that shit, so he only starts enjoying the fight even more. He leaps into the air and is about to come crashing down on her. But before that could happen, she does something to mess with his vision and his punch ends up missing. As the midget gets back up, he now sees tons of Emmas, so he realizes that she must have taken control of his suit's optic sensors. He starts running to find which one is the real Emma, but the first few are just illusions, and while he is distracted, the real Emma shows up behind him and stabs through his suit. He shakes her off and tries to punch her, but Emma evades and fades back into a crowd of her illusions. However, even though he is being overwhelmed, Midget just keeps smiling as a timer is ticking down on his display. He then proceeds to jam his fist into the ground and use a pulse accompanied with flames to get rid of all the Emma clones, leaving only the real one. As the timer reaches zero, some recharging stations pop out of the ground, but as Emma tries to get to one, Midget throws some bombs and destroys it while he still gets his own recharge. This leaves Emma's suit without power and her completely at the mercy of whatever Midget wants to do. He begins taking his sweet time pulverizing her body, but inside, Emma is still trying to hold out a little longer so Hegan can awaken. In the truck, a recording Emma made begins playing and it says she made this in case she died before he could get ready. She informs him that long ago, Mary had actually saved her, so the two of them stayed in touch with one another secretly. Even on the night she was killed, Emma heard about it and tried to rush there to save them, but it was already too late to save Mari and Hegan's son. However, she saw an opportunity to save Hegan, so she took it. She apologizes to Hegan for not being able to save his wife or son, but she wanted to at least help make Mary's dream for Hegan come true. Mary wanted Hegan to live on, so Emma wanted to do her best to make that happen. But it looks like it's the end for her. After hearing all this, Hegan's emotions spike and drive up the synchronization rate with the suit. This causes a blackout in the area, and the midget turns to see what's going on. From the truck emerges Hegan in his new suit, and he is ready to finally get his revenge. This was the end of episode 6. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.